I'm going to ask a couple questions, and then we'll open up the floor for questions as well. So be ready. Get your fingers on the buzzer. Nobody's moving. I mean, it's amazing. Um, the, the first question I wanted to ask you, and it's actually, we'll just start here and then go uh, to the your left, um, is the question about leadership. In many of the ways that we've discussed it tonight has been about approval ratings and winning the next election. But is that really what leadership is supposed to be about. If, if it is, then is it all about just the battle and the win, or is it also about the public policy? I'll start with my public policy guru here, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Go ahead, uh, Paul. Well, hopefully, uh, leadership wouldn't be all about uh, ratings in the, uh, in the latest polls, because those fluctuate, and uh, Curtis used that big word, legitimacy, and if legitimacy comes down to your standing with polls, then it's a pretty uh, limited notion of what's legitimate. Governments get to their legitimacy by being electing the majority of members to the House of Commons or the legislature and so on. Um, but clearly the focal point is increasingly on leaders, but this work by this Finnish political scientist looking at a number of countries over time indicates that the relative importance of leadership in determining elections outcome varies and we shouldn't assume automatically that a charming image or a telegenic personality uh, means electoral success. A lot depends on the context. So just, I'll, I'll, I'll finish on this, just on this point. Uh, Kelly mentioned the fact that um, uh, she wasn't pleased with any of the leaders in the province currently. She's getting grumpy at a far too young an age. Uh, uh, <laughs> And I, I'd be interested, I, I, th I think I've detected a kind of dynamic at work here, uh, that when the opposition is weak, the potential for unrest in the governing party goes up because they feel less at risk. If we had strong opposition, the pressure on the dissidents within the uh, NDP cabinet and caucus would have been much, much greater. And then, also when the opposition parties are weak and go through leaders like Stuart Murray and Hugh McFadden and so on, hubris development, which you've mentioned. And I think if you look comparatively, like Archie Brown does in this huge book on uh, comparative political leadership, that's what brings uh, leaders down most often. Uh, unwarranted pride in their own capacity to act alone, act unilaterally without consulting their followers. So followers are not cheap to be led to the slaughter. They will revolt. We may not have the formal mechanism, as David described, that exists in the Australian political parties, but we found ways to get rid of leaders. And Solinger's uh, uh, resilience in this, uh, we'll see what happens, but he may come back uh, as, le as premier with 55% uh, of the delegates approving of his leadership. One of the things that I find uh, interesting about these trends is that uh, it underplays something political scientists used to talk about called the electoral cycle, which is uh, governments could do sort of unpopular things early in their uh, in their mandate, and you know, that would be forgotten by the time of the uh, time of the next election. Well, might be forgotten by their uh, uh, by the electorate, but the party seems to be paying attention to it. And the, the leader's ability to do things that are unpopular seems to be becoming increasingly limited, which may not be a very good thing in terms of uh, uh, the public policy. I do also think the fact that, and I like the point of what do, uh, I, I would love to see more cabinet ministers, not just in Manitoba, but around the country, resign on principle when the principle is at play, not months later. Uh, it's a, I'm going to resign in a huff, but I'm going to stay for six months. Like that. But that certainly does not contribute to faith in the political system. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I love that uh, that analogy, David, and, and I totally agree. I mean, it's. Um, <laughs> I think people want more. I mean, I think that they're they're hungry for more. Um, they, you know, they we keep assuming that it's all about the leader and the, the you know the flashy leader and who do you want to have a beer with and that kind of thing. That only takes you so far. And I think we really underestimate the, the the voters out there. They want public policy. They want good ideas. And if you've got good ideas, then you can ride out a weak leader or you know or maybe a, a more glad leader. But at the end of the day, if you don't have anything to back it up, then the party collapses. And and we saw we've seen certainly. 
in my research, I've certainly seen that happen to the progressive conservatives in the past. Once Gary Filman left, uh, the party was 10 years uh, in the wilderness. Perhaps some say we're still sort of like we should in the wilderness a little bit. But because there was really, once Filman left, there was really nothing holding the party together. And they really didn't have a good sense of where they were or, or what they stood for or, or really uh, what, their, what their ideas were going to be moving forward. And so parties really do themselves a disservice by putting their, all their eggs in the leadership basket because I think voters expect more now. Okay. At, at the same time, though, I, I think I think those are all those are all excellent points. But I think I think part of it too is that I think that people also have much more. You know, there there are much more ways for sort of pressure. I think to be exerted, and in terms of you know think, you know leaders sort of writing out an unpopular policy, uh, I think it's that much more difficult to do that in this you know in this day and age. Sort of you know like Paul alluded to earlier, sort of more twenty four seven kind of slightly more hostile uh, news coverage. Also, the fact that people can post things on. Social media, they can you know get right in touch with uh, you know their MLAs, you know all these sorts of things, all these sort of venues for public opinion and for the public to express itself and to express its displeasure with unpopular policies, uh, and you know by extension unpopular, you know to make that leadership that approve those policies unpopular. Uh, it, it's much easier for them, I think, to do that. I think it's much it's much more pervasive, and also people, in some to some extent, I think also do have a you know a bit more you know the sort of timeline for. Uh, uh, you know, people's leashes are a lot shorter. I think, in terms, you know, to some extent, in terms of making some of those, uh, making some of those decisions. So I think that I think that factors into it as well. And I think that you know, things and things like polls, I think, are just sort of one of the top of mind uh, things that reflect that uh, in terms of uh, exerting that uh, policy. I mean, is it is it a, is it a good thing? You know, personally, I, no, I, I don't think I don't think it is. But I just think that's the uh, that's the reality, unfortunately. Just uh, really quickly then, just with a quick focus between you and uh, Kelly uh, Curtis, uh, what do you think the chances are that we might see a fragmentation of the NDP and a new party started? And would a new party actually be a good idea um, as a result of uh, what's happened with, uh, with the, I think we're calling them the Gang of Five, but they're also the Rebel Five. Yeah. And, uh, the 5.5, five, and we're not really sure. <laughs> okay, go ahead. What do you think? I, I, don't, I don't think that will happen, uh, personally. You know, that, that did happen in Manitoba in the late 70s. Um, there was, the, you know, there, I guess in 1981, the Progressive Party was kind of a splinter of the, uh, of the NDP, and, and they, didn't, uh, they didn't do very well. Uh, in, in that particular election, and, and the, the, the NDP, I think, in, in particular, the, the NDP have kind of been referred to, you know, by some as, as you know, Manitoba's natural governing party, at least certainly in the in the modern era. And I, I think that you know, for there to be a split, like an actual like, split within the NDP, I think you, you, enough people in there, you know, even especially the Rebel Five, who I think are quite more motivated more by pragmatism than anything, mm -hmm. uh, considering what they've done, I don't think they would go to that, you know, go to that extent because basically the, the outcome of that is maybe electing electing conservative governments. Kelly, do you have to add to that? Or? Yeah, no, I, I really agree. I mean, okay. there's really no room uh, in the Manitoba political spectrum for for any more parties. Some say there isn't even room for three parties. Yeah. We can see how the Liberals are, are have been struggling for so many decades now to get under their feet. So I really don't see that happening. 